Well, um, we're so delighted that people are joining us. I'm, I'm the welcomer, so um, welcome to you. And I'm so glad that you're able to be with us today. And I have a feeling there will be more um, trickling in and we're just encouraging people to show up however, that, however they can. Um, we're just delighted if you're, if you're busy and you need to kind of have it on the side. We love that. We love that you're here with us. So, um, so thank you for showing up in any way that you can. Um, I am going to start uh, by sharing my screen and we're going to talk a little bit uh, just to review a little bit about the alternative giving fair. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen as people are continuing to enter in. Thank you, Barb Farmer. We haven't had a chance to thank Barb for um, managing our presentations every week. So this is the fourth week of uh, a four week uh, session through Bethel U, but um, through um, Bethel Lutheran Church in Northfield. And um, it's, our session has been called, How Can I Help in a World of Need? Um, this, is, uh, this is basically a theme that seems super appropriate this year. We all feel overwhelmed in many ways, but um, I think in the, in the uh, situation that we're in where many of us um, have some comforts that others don't at this time during COVID. Um, you know, we're wondering how can we be allies? How can we help? What can we do um, to help those that are struggling, whether it's related to COVID or, um, or the general struggle that so many humans um, experience as a constant. So um, I've been promoting this idea of getting comfortable with discomfort and um, this is one of those ways by showing up here and learning about a way that you can help um, or multiple ways that you can help and be of assistance, whether it's just plain raising your awareness or literally um, causing you to move into that from empathy to compassion, where you are actually active and actually responding um, to a need. Um, so feeling that empathy, but also um, taking it one step further. Um, so we have been meeting and we wanted to mention at the beginning and of course at the end our very own special special Mac Gimsey who is our Northfield Living Treasure. Um, he's going to be sharing a prayer, um, maybe more. Um, at the end of our session today we're so delighted um, one more time to have Mac Gimsey with us sharing with us. He is an inspiration and I have to tell you he is such an affirming human. It has been so lovely to have Mac on board with us because every time we meet like this, he sends us two or three emails telling us how much he loves us. Um, Amy and I have just been loved up by Mac. And, um, and so we just want you to know, Mac, that we love you and we're so glad you're here with us again. Um, I think, am I handing it over to you, Amy? This happens to me. Okay, yep. Yeah. Um, Amy, I think you're on and then I'll, you'll switch back to me in a bit. Okay, so uh, just to reiterate kind of the logistics of the alternative giving fair, you should have gotten the packet if you're a Bethel member, should have gotten a packet in the mail. Um, if you didn't or you're not a Bethel member, you can go to Bethel's website and under, is it connect, Barb? Is it connect and I think at the heading. Right on the front. Connect, connect and grow. Yeah, connect and grow. You can go under there or it's on the front page um, and you can find the information for the Shop for the World Alternative Giving Fair. There's a link to a page that just has all the stuff on Shop for the World. Um, and on there, you'll see our um, pamphlet that we put together. I'm holding it up here. Um, and then also there's a shopping list and there's a picture right there on the screen of the shopping list. And you can fill that out. Each of those items are um, described in more detail in the in the pamphlet so you can read more about them in the pamphlet and we just ask that you prayfully consider how you want to give and um, trying to offset that one trillion dollars that Americans spend on Christmas this year last year and the year before each year one trillion dollars um, and just giving in alternative ways and in meaningful ways that will make a positive impact in many people's lives. And so you can um, fill out the shopping list and then there's a couple ways you can submit this. So you can either mail that to Bethel, 
you fill out that form with a check, one check written to Bethel. We want to make it as easy as possible for you to give. So um, I know there's many different projects on the shopping list, but if you write um, one check to Bethel and then we sort that all out and make sure those the money that you designated for a certain project goes to that project. We do all that for you. Um, and so you can write one check, mail it to Bethel. You can see it down in the lower right corner there is the address for Bethel. Um, you can also just drop it off right in the vestibule. There's a bin right when you walk in the door to the right is an alternative giving fair table. And just to the left of that table is a bin that you can drop um, your shopping list and a check in. And at that table, if you are going to the church to do that, there are cards and there's pictures right there on the screen of complimentary cards for each <clears throat> project you give to you um, get a complimentary card and then there's also inserts and so on the left side of the screen you'll see an example of an insert where it says a gift has been given in your honor and it describes what the gift is the amounts are not put on there so you don't have to worry about that when you're giving um, to someone but the idea is that you would take an insert, put that in a card, and you give that as a gift for a friend or family member for the holidays. And the all the inserts are there in the church. If you don't wanna leave your home and or you can't get to church or you're further away, you can email me and down on the lower right corner, you can see my email address and I can send you a PDF of an insert. <clears throat> I can't get you the cards, but I can get you the inserts. So there's a couple different ways that you can access all of that, um, those materials. And then Karna is going to just highlight a few of the projects in our pamphlet. And then after that, we'll introduce our special guest today. Me? Yes. Can you talk about the last date to do this? Oh, yes. So we have on the pamphlet, it says today is our last date, but um, you can send in your shopping list and your forms all the way up to Christmas. So um, we will not uh, turn that away. There is no deadline on that, but um, at least up through Christmas and then we have to get it all sorted and sent off to the um, organization. Okay. So thank you for that, Barb. Okay, Amy, thank you so much for sharing that information. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Okay, I'm asking because I'm getting a little message saying your internet connection is unstable. So I might be asking that again to make sure. Um, so I wanted to just share with you a little bit about a few of the projects that are in our booklet. Just briefly, we haven't highlighted all of them and we're just gonna highlight a few more. We've been highlighting a few every week. Um, the memory project is a unique one that has just, uh, that we just started with this year. And as you, as many of you know, I'm a visual art teacher at the high school here in Northfield. And um, this is one of my students. Um, two years ago, we participated in our, this wonderful project from Iowa. Actually, this project is based in Iowa. I can't remember what city, um, but, uh, but it's a really incredible project that's basically bringing joy to a whole lot of people and, and mainly young people. Um, we are actually participating in this, my high school students um, as well this year. And um, we are painting portraits of kids who live in Afghanistan. They're all located at Malala um, uh, sponsored schools. And so they're, they send their portraits to us, um, this organization in Iowa. We uh, paint them and send them back as a gift um, to the child as a way of marking uh, this moment in time for them. Um, and so these are some examples from some kids that we painted from Pakistan. And uh, we literally are starting this project like right now. So you can donate to support um, the sending of these portraits, not just our specific portraits, but in general, this organization who's bringing joy to the world. This is literally the, uh, the information that we have in the booklet, if you happen to see that and weren't really sure what that was, excuse me, what that was all about. Um, I'm actually starting my demo portrait today to show kids how to begin painting and mixing, you know, skin tones. And it's a really great um, opportunity for my own high school students who are remote to be learning about um, portrait painting and how to work with color. So it's been really fun and kind of close to my heart being an art teacher. Wanted to, of course, again, mention, as you see on the right here, our um, support of Scott and Elga Broughton's school. This year we've added um, this school, um, which is in Honduras. Um, it's called Blessing to the Nations. I've mentioned it once before 
for, but they are looking for donations for classroom morning snacks um, for $2.50 a day. Um, they're also looking for larger donations for um, projects that relate to the school building, like window repair, roof repair, batteries for solar panels, etc. So we know Jean and Darlene have been here every single week with us, and we're so grateful. And thank you, those of you who are interested in and in hoping to support their son's school in Honduras. Um, we have some other projects like this one um, for future nurses um, for Vietnam. Um, this would th this thirty-three dollar payment would take care of five uh, take care of textbooks for five rural nursing students in Vietnam. Um, we are also supporting and encouraging people to support a mobile pharmacy in Haiti. Um, as you can see here, it says there are only six healthcare professionals for every ten thousand people in Haiti. So 40% of Haiti's population has no access to healthcare. Um, so this mobile pharmacy is really making a difference in getting around to villages. Um, another way to encourage um, health in villages is um, to support this organization, which is based out of Denver, Colorado, um, who are basically refurbishing bikes and sending them, repairing them and shipping them to Africa, um, Namibia, Z uh, Tan Tanzania and Zambia in order to encourage um, uh, medicine to be able to be uh, run by bike to the marginalized people living in those countries. Um, there's also some great educational things happening that we've talked a lot about. Um, LPGM is an organization that we tend to support quite a bit through our alternative giving fair um, due to our close connections with them when it comes to education, but we also are supporting this awesome donkey mobile library in Ethiopia. We love all these ways that people are transporting um, things that are important for learning, for medicine, uh, and that's another transportation related uh, project that we're supporting. There's a couple other projects um, besides Charity Water, which we're really excited to talk with you about today. Um, these two are related to the environment, um, one that is located in the Democratic Republic of Congo that are that's uh, basically encouraging um, the planting of trees to help a family overcome poverty, help them uh, create an income source. And, um, and then this managing fires and protecting wildlife in Australia, as you know, um, fires have, have been a problem there um, in recent uh, history. And um, you can pay $83 to support conservation and fire management practices there. So those are some more projects that we've included in our booklet. Um, we, of course, have about 27 projects. So I've just shared a few um, encouraging you to give and so excited um, that you're here with us today. All right. Well, I would like to introduce our guest today. Um, we have Paige Nagel coming all the way from New York City. Um, she is with um, the international organization Charity Water. She's the key relationships officer at Charity Water and has been um, for the past two years. She is a Midwesterner from Iowa, so um, and studied nonprofit management at University of Northern Iowa, received her master's degree at St. Ambrose University, also in Iowa. And she's been spreading her Midwest nice all over New York for the last couple of years. <laughs> and as she told me the other day, she's slowly turning into her mother who loved plants. And she now has what, 13 in your Brooklyn apartment bedroom? <laughs> the pandemic has uh, like forced my green thumb and now I'm just obsessed. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. well, and I just, um, I'm excited about this organization. My husband and I kind of just stumbled upon it a couple of years ago. We've supported it and Paige has even made a house call to our home um, after we donated to Charity Water and she came and had lunch with us in our home and told us more um, about it. And so it's a great organization and she is here to tell us how they are bringing clean water to the world and uh, one well at a time. So take it away, Paige. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me get my presentation going. And okay, can everybody see? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, maybe it's just going to take a minute. Share screen. Laptop. Share. There. Oh. 
Yes. There we go. We're good now? Yep. yep. Okay, great. Um, yes, so thank you for that intro, Amy. Um, <laughs> I uh, had to sort of chuckle because my first slide in this presentation is basically just what you just said. <laughs> um, I, you, Paige, if you want to put it in slide mode. Yeah. Oh, slide and, mode, not in slide mode. You're in notes mode, I think, probably. Oh. Here, let me, I am just Zoom um, illiterate, it turns out. It's okay. okay. Let's see. Full screen. I don't even need notes. But how do I make it bigger? Let's see, we had it earlier. We did, and I did the exact same thing. <laughs> Hmm. I'll just make it bigger. I wonder if it's the one right next to the X page. Um, this? Yeah, that one. Try that one. Aha! There we go. Now can you see the full screen? Yep. Okay, yep. great. Um, so yes, I am from Iowa and I, <laughs> it's so funny that you said Midwest nice because I was like, I, how am I going to relate? Um, on my bio at Charity Water, one of the first things I put in was Iowa Nice. Like I, I moved to New York for this job with Charity Water. And it's so funny that they, they sort of write up a bio about you. And in mine, it, the last line is, her favorite thing about being new to New York is her um, confusing New Yorkers with her Iowa Nice. It's like, who, could, who would this resonate with better than a bunch of Minnesota Nice folks? <laughs> so yes, I, I've been with Charity Water for two years. And I think this really actually plays into how I got into the nonprofit sector um, because there's, you know, a sense of community in small towns. And I think I saw um, taking care of your neighbors as behavior that was modeled in the church I grew up in, in my parents, in my grandparents. And that's really sort of what led me into the nonprofit sector. Um, without even realizing it at the time, but as a young kid, just being involved in volunteering and then realizing in college that, oh, I could do this for a living um, was really sort of a neat transformation. Um, but how I got to Charity Water or what attracted me to Charity Water was really images like this and statistics like this, um, 785 million people living in the world without access to clean water um, and just being pretty blown away by that number and not really even being able to fathom what that looks like. Um, just to give you a sense though, it's about one in every 10 people and it's about twice the population of the US. So a really, really huge number of people that don't have um, basic access to something that, you know, we, I definitely take for granted and it's a part of my day every day. And still it's, I live in a small New York apartment with two sinks and two toilets and two showers. Um, and, and I can access that water within seconds. So, um, it's, it's something that when I learned about the issue, it really just sort of consumed me and I just had to be a part of it, um, and found charity water while, um, researching just like best practices in the nonprofit sector, um, and immediately became a supporter. And this was before I ever even moved. I was just like hooked on this mission and then an opportunity arose to, um, apply for a job and it applied on a whim thinking they're not going to hire someone from small town Iowa and here we are so just like a really sort of beautiful story and like the steps along the way to being a part of this really really incredible mission so our mission is to bring clean and safe drinking water to every person on the planet um, charity water started in 2006 um, by Scott Harrison. Some of you have the book possibly, Thirst. So if you're reading that, you're hearing all about his story. But Scott was actually a nightclub promoter. So lots of drinking, lots of partying, um, lots of risky behavior, and got to a point in his life where he just had to, you know, turn it around like a 180, um, just really wanted to change his life. So he ended up on a, a hospital ship off the coast of Liberia and saw um, firsthand what a difference clean water made. So this hospital ship was seeing, you know, hundreds of thousands of people a year 
and half of those people were coming to the ship with diseases that were preventable if only they had clean water to drink. So he came back to the US and just said like, I have to do something about this issue that is so huge. At the time it was about a billion people without access. So we've come a long way, um, but still that number so, so huge. But when he came back, he, he wanted to start this organization but he also wanted to really reinvent charity. And he himself was skeptical of the nonprofit sector and felt that from his, his circle of friends and from the community he was in. So he wanted to set out to do some things differently when he started Charity Water. So the, the three biggest things were a 100% model, proving projects and working with local partners. So I'll dive into each of those a little bit, but um, Charity Water has a 100% model. Essentially what that means is we have two bank accounts. We have a bank account that is all of our operations costs and a bank account that is all of our programming, all of the water projects we fund. And we have a group of private supporters, private donors, about 130 now we're at individuals, families, and corporations that fund all of our overhead so that when anybody drops a donation on our website or becomes a monthly donor or supports our work in any way, 100% of that goes to the actual projects um, they want to support. Um, this goes as far as paying for the credit card fees online. So if someone drops a donation online with their credit card, the operations side of things will cover that, you know, few dollars fee or few cents fee, which is really, really incredible. Um, not an easy thing to do by any means. Um, it's, it's really, really tough, but I think it helped that we started out like that. Like that was, he was just determined to make that work. And um, while it's still a challenge all these years later, it, it also is one of the biggest attractors um, to people um, to Charity Water. When we ask people like, what, you know, what made, what, what made you want to give? Oftentimes it's water, but there's so many water organizations, right? There's hundreds, thousands of organizations working towards ending this issue, but the 100% model really seems to resonate with a lot of folks. Um, next was proving projects. So we use photos, GPS coordinates, and we map all of our completed projects on our website um, so that, um, folks can actually see where their funds went. So it's really, really sort of incredible. Again, a very difficult thing to do. Um, and as we scale, we're trying to figure out how we can continue to do this and continue to do this in really meaningful ways. Um, but I, it's, I get to share these images of these communities when that project is done. And that is just the most incredible thing to be able to see the actual people that you helped um, with your hard earned money, which is, um, really, really a special, special thing about Charity Water. And then the third um, is working with local partners. So we really believe that um, sustainability and um, longevity of projects um, is best when it's led by locals. Um, a lot of organizations I'm hearing more and more are using the term solutions architect. So like who's best set to create change in these communities? I'm not from Uganda. I don't, I don't know what's best for Uganda, but you know who does is the people that live in know Uganda. So we are really, really proud of all of the local partners that we work with and the incredible work that they do. They are so smart and so incredible and know these communities better than we could ever know them, even if we spent, even if we you know, moved our team there, we would never fully understand the culture and the context and what people really need. Um, and also it's a huge economic um, boost for these communities too. These are, these are paid roles, paid jobs. Um, and that's, um, you know, that has long-term effects as well. And, and ownership too. I think it's really important for communities to see that it's their fellow citizens that are bringing these solutions to them. So they, they get to be celebrated as the heroes of this work. So what does that mean for us to date? Um, uh, really, really exciting numbers. Um, we've funded over 59,000 water projects, individual water points, um, over 11.6 million people served in our 14 year history. And um, we've also started implementing sensors a few years ago. We had an initial grant with Google that funded this new development. Um, and those actually track 
um, water flow of um, wells. These are specifically on wells and tap stands. Um, and uh, they, they, they not only track that a water project is working, which is maybe the most important thing, but also how much it's being pumped or how much it's um, putting out. So it gives us really, really incredible data um, to, to determine if, if a project is maybe on the fritz. We know most of the places that we work are very rural. So if we can watch uh, the, the chart of the flow of water coming in through the sensor and then notice, okay, we're flatlining, something's obviously wrong with that well, we need to get it repaired. Um, so of course, in the grand scheme of things, 7,000 of 59,000 have sensors not where we want to be. I, in an ideal state, everything we did would have a sensor, but it's such new technology that um, we're, we're still piloting and making sure it's the, the best um, technology possible so that we can expand on that. But really, really exciting if you're into technology at all and in the rural space to have this piece of um, technology work is, is really kind of miraculous. So um, we're, we're stoked about that. Um, and what that means. So all of those projects for us means that there is um, less time spent collecting water, right? It's, it's healthier families first and foremost, but what does that mean when you're not spending four hours collecting water that's gonna make your family sick? Um, children are going to school, uh, families, parents, um, mothers and fathers are getting jobs. Um, there's an economic uh, boost to the community as a whole. We see that for every dollar invested in clean water it yields between four and $12 for the community. So this really snowballs into so many other areas, right? It's, it's not just about health, it, it really does change everything. We often say water changes everything because it, it trickles into so many other areas. I also wanna note, um, some of you may know, those, know this, but water is actually very much a women and girls issue because it's typically the women and the young girls who are tasked with collecting water every day. So that means they're the ones without jobs, they're the ones not going to school. So clean water is truly a gender equalizer as well. Um, so that's, I think that's really important to note because um, that's a, a issue that's really important to me. Um, so just wanted to bring a little bit of light to that. So here's where we work. Um, we are currently working in about 20 different countries and with 43 different local partners. Um, so our area or our focus is in rural areas um, because about 80% of the, the water crisis, that 785 million is in rural populations. Um, the other thing is that we want to have a, a somewhat narrow focus. I mean, we could work in twice the number of countries um, but uh, several years back, we decided, okay, we're going to focus on Asia or Southeast Asia and Africa because we have really great partners there and we know that we can be there for years to come. Um, so we, we decided to sort of narrow our scope, but um, work towards full coverage in these areas before expanding any further. Um, and the other note is um, we've worked in um, Central and um, South America in the past. Um, but we just saw that we had a, a greater impact, really plain and, plain and simply, in Africa and Asia. And so, you know, there's so many players in this in the in the water sector, um, and we just felt like we're doing the most good in these areas. Let's stick to that. And best case scenario, we get full coverage in these areas, or we're a part of a system that's helping get full coverage in these areas, and then we can expand. Um, I also wanted to share a little bit about the spring because this is such an incredible um, community of supporters and a really, really um, unique um, way to give that I, Charity Water was sort of a leader in. Um, I mentioned that I, I sought out Charity Water as I was like researching best practices. I was working at a university at the time and uh, we wanted to launch a monthly giving program. Like some, needed some sort of sustainability and giving. Um, and of course looked to Charity Water because they do so many things well. And Charity Water started this spring in 2006 because they saw a, a big decline the year prior in, um, in giving overall in, our, in how much we raised that year. So set out to try to figure out how can we get people really excited about, 
excited about giving over and over again, like making it really a part of their life and part of their day to day. And um, looking at the, the idea of subscriptions, right? Like think of your Netflix, your HBO, your Spotify, like we live in such a subscription based world these days. And how could or could we create a subscription for good? Like what is, what, can we add one into that mix that was not about making my life easier, getting my Amazon Prime books here in two days, but really was just about helping someone else. So the spring was launched. It's been such an incredible program for us. The growth has been amazing. Um, we now are represented in over hundred different countries around the world. So just sort of mind blowing to think that it's reached that many people. Um, and it's, uh, we start every year um, with almost $20 million and support from the spring. So there are 66,000 members of the spring. And our goal at the beginning of 21, um, 2020 was to reach 20 million a year in the spring memberships. Um, and we reached that this fall somehow, even in the midst of this crazy pandemic. Um, so we're all just sort of in awe of the sense of community that we get from the spring and the people that just keep showing up. Um, it costs on average, and I think this is what uh, is listed in the alternative giving fair sheet, but it costs on average $40 to bring one person clean water. And so we, we sort of set that out as like, we hope you could give $40 a month, but there are you know, tons of people that can give less, lots of people that can give more. The average gift a month is about $25. And, but you know, the, those little drops in the bucket times 66,000 people over a hundred different countries is just really, really massive and really incredible. And it's all about sustainability. Again, it comes back to being able to do this work and keep doing it year over year. And this community just keeps showing up. So we're really, really proud of this. So 2020, um, <laughs> just the wildest year, as we all know, um, we were on track to have our biggest year yet. Our goal at the beginning of the year was to serve 1.5 million new people with clean water this year. Um, we came out of 2019 celebrating an awesome year and planning for the year ahead. We had a staff summit in February um, and had a little celebration afterwards. And then a week later, we got a notice that there was a case of COVID-19 in our building. Um, not in our office specifically, but in our building. So everybody got a notice from HR, like take your laptops home. We might be working from home next week. And then that next week and turned to the end of the month turned into, you know, just kept snowballing until some of you might've been on this call. We made the decision to close our office. So definitely uh, a lot has changed for us in terms of like how we're working and where we're working. But I think most importantly, um, the issue of clean water is, has really hit close to home, closer to home than it ever has for me, I know. Um, here in the States, we talk about prevention um, and that first line of defense being masks and hand washing. Um, but really in the places we work, it's, it's not flattening the curve as much as you have to keep that curve flat from the beginning. Um, these are very rural areas. The hospital systems are either non-existent or very hard to reach or not quite the capacity that we would expect, you know, from the hospital systems here. I mean, we're even seeing our hospital systems at capacity. So um, to put this in the context of rural Uganda is a totally different story. So the, the, our efforts really shifted to like, how can we help be a part of prevention? The prevention is the key in the places we work. So early on, we um, put out um, an ask to our supporters to help fund some COVID relief um, and to assist our local partners as they sort of shifted to being frontline workers. Um, and so we raised almost a million dollars for things like PPE, um, putting out PSAs in local communities, um, setting up emergency hand washing stations, like all of these things that help um, with prevention. And our local partners went from being drillers to frontline workers. Um, so it was really incredible to see their shift too and how quickly they responded, how quickly our community responded and helping them respond. Um, just really, really sort of mind blowing that, um, you know, we could from afar 
um, come together with a plan with these folks and make sure that these communities were safe. And while continuing to bring clean water to new people, we were also um, making a, a huge difference in the fight against COVID in these places. I'm gonna try to play this little jingle. Um, I hope it works. Um, being a 90s kid, I just remember jingles about bad things, like really upbeat, songs about scary things and you'll see in this picture there's that's a giant speaker and so this is one of our partners in Uganda that um put out a PSA and um about the coronavirus and you'll hear it say beware beware corona's a killer and I am going to try to play this um, so just kind of wild like when I hear that it makes me chuckle but I also had that song stuck in my head for months um and it's you know it's a way to reach people over the radio and make them you know think about this as an issue that they needed to be aware of um, so really unique ways that each local partner sort of addressed um, the issue of getting the message out about um, prevention and washing hands and all of those things. In Nepal, um, just one more example, um, setting up emergency hand washing stations in communities. And these are in the bottom photo, like this is a family that is in the queue essentially to receive a new water point in their um, tap stands near their home, but they're not there yet. Um, and so they brought hand washing stations to each individual household and family. So while they're waiting to receive that water point, at least they have a, a source, a small source of clean water that'll last them a week to wash their hands, wash their dishes and help um, slow the spread. Uh, so just a few more photos of other communities and hand washing stations and some of the materials and um, they use them to make masks and businesses started with the mask making, just really, really beautiful efforts to um, adjust to this new way of life. Um, yes, yeah, so I, uh, just a couple more slides and then I want to open it up for questions, but I think, you know, at the beginning of this, you started it really beautifully in talking about what do we do with empathy and how do we turn that into action? I think in the midst of this year, something that we've seen from our community of supporters is just this in, incredible sense of generosity. And it's something that we've tried to focus inward on as well. Um, and yes, there's, there's so much need out there. I don't know if you're, if you're anything like me and I feel like if you're on this call, you probably are. Um, it, this year has been sort of paralyzing and like there's so much need everywhere and not knowing what to do or wanting to do more than one person can even be you know, capable of doing. But I think um, for me, it's been a sense of practicing generosity daily. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't suggest a couple ways to support us. Um, the spring is a great way to do that. Sponsoring a project like Amy and Bryce have done, it's a way to do that. Talk to your family and friends about the water crisis. Just like share one little tidbit from this presentation, read the book if you haven't already or share it with a friend when you're done. Um, but I think oh, well, how I wanna leave this is just that um, you know, generosity, plain and simple breeds more generosity and we all need more of that in our life. Um, it, it doesn't have to be charity water. Um, I mean that really, really sincerely. There's so many incredible organizations like, oh, I got, I got choked up just seeing the the ones that you um, presented at the beginning of this and the art project Karna, that is so amazing. Um, so I would just, I guess my my take on this, when I read the the theme of this this series, like how can I help in a world of need, find something that resonates with you, find something that speaks to you and try to make that a part of your daily life. Like yes, part of this alternative giving fair, but I really encourage you to find something that you want to keep learning more about and keep diving deeper into and, and um, something that'll stick with you, something that will bring you as much joy and bring you as much excitement as it does the people that you're helping um, serve. So practicing that generosity daily, um, smiling at a stranger, <laughs> I guess under a mask, um, you know, just, just we all need more of that. And I, I guess my hope is that 
um, we can all walk away with ideas for how to be more generous in general. So I'll leave it at that because um, I'll get choked up if I talk too much more. <laughs> Um, but I do want to, if we have time, I went a little bit over probably, um, if we have time, I would love to take some questions if anybody has any. Yeah, absolutely. Feel free to unmute and just speak up if anyone has a question. Uh, yeah, I, I have a question. Um, so have you worked, uh, we've worked a lot in uh, the Central African Republic in yeah. Africa, and uh, we've worked with, uh, Jim Hawking and Water for Good. Do you, uh, do you work with them or partner with them or how, do, how does that work? We don't, I'm familiar with Water for Good, not the, not the other one you mentioned. Um, but so I'll try to like really high level sort of give you a sense of how we work with local partners. So every six months, our local partners will come to us with, um, we'll actually put out a, a request for proposal. So an RFP to everyone we work with to, sort of write to us with their needs. Um, so for example, a Water for Good would write to us and say, we, we really need help with getting 100 wells um, constructed in this part of the country. And um, then we set out the next six months in fundraise for those projects. So we do that all across our portfolio. So we're actually working on those RFPs with our local partners right now. And then come January, January to the end of June, our team goes out and raises the money for those projects. And then we, we grant them out to those local partners. And I wanna mention this because I think this is where it can kind of get confusing for folks with our 100% model. When we work with multinational organizations, bigger organizations like Water for Good, um, when, we're, when we're funding those projects, it doesn't go to their overhead at all. It goes to um, the materials needed, the, the fuel it takes to run a drilling rig, um, the, the time um, to pay staff, the actual drillers. So it's really the boots on the ground. Um, and if anybody's curious, I'm happy to send sort of like a budget breakdown of what that looks like. But um, we work with both multinational, international organizations, as well as really grassroots. It's, it's sort of all over the spectrum um, when it comes to our local partners. Uh, I, just the little I know, it's just yeah. an incredible network of yeah. organizations and people who do this work all over the world. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty amazing. And uh, we've, we've done a number of wells or, or supported, uh, financed uh, a few wells and spring boxes and, uh, and various ways of um, producing clean water in the Central African Republic. And the, the little I know just uh, amazes me at the, uh, the work you do. Your presentation was uh, delightful and oh, thank you. great. So thank you for that. I, I tried to squeeze a lot into a very little amount of time. I could talk about this for days. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I hope it wasn't too much, but got enough. During COVID, were you able to do any of this well work? Yeah. So we're really, really lucky that the majority of the places we work, our partners were deemed essential workers. So they got to continue work at a slower pace, definitely, because the teams were reduced, like a drilling team, which is maybe, you know, 10 people normally in certain places was down to six, let's say. Um, and um, supply chains, for an example, there were there were periods of time where you couldn't cross borders. So that slowed things up. But generally speaking, we were still able to work. There's a couple places um, where we are not rural, and that's in India, in particular. Um, we work in Calcutta, and everything was totally, totally shut down until really like September. Um, so that's one of the places where we just, we were halted, you know, our hands were tied, we couldn't do anything. Um, but, you know, the, the great majority of places we were able to still, um, still progress. Thank you. Yeah, good, great question. Any other questions for Paige? Yeah, it's Bryce. I have a question for you, Paige. I'm just curious about, I know that part of your sponsorships come from corporations. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just curious, like how that, statistically how that works. And I know this year has been, uh, I got a little mailing I read and I know this year has been a different year for corporations, of course, too. So I'm just wondering about, obviously this is all geared toward individuals, but like the what role do corporations play and how does that relationship work? Yeah, 
So we have actually have, um, I'm on the key relationships team. I work with like individuals and families supporting our work. We have another small team that works with the corporate side of things. And I would say that by far and away, that's where we took the biggest hit this year. Like that's, that's been our biggest struggle is like what's going to get cut in a business if you're, if your own budget is down, it's, it's the, the philanthropic support of your company. Um, so we saw a really big dip there. Um, but they've, they've adjusted really well too, and found ways to sort of rally around things like the spring, like how, okay, maybe our company can't sponsor a well this year, but could we see if everybody wants to pitch in 10 bucks as a spring member? And so they've, they've done some really kind of fun things with bigger corporations that can't give, but maybe have a big network and can at least spread awareness and spread the word about the issue. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a tough year for, um, for profit company giving for sure. Mm -hmm. So with your network, um, do you, do you uh, take in any government money, USAID or anything like that for-, for We don't, products? we don't. A lot of the organizations we work with do, but, um, but we don't um, fundraise from any government grants or anything like that. Yeah. The mm -hmm. teams that do the actual labor, are they local people from that area or are they outsiders coming in to do the work? Yeah, truly local. So all of the pictures that I showed, if you, a lot of those were um, staff members of our local partners and we really, really try as best as possible, at least on like what we're funding, we're funding people that are of the community of, of Uganda, of Ethiopia, of the Central African Republic, and they're the ones doing the work. A lot of times we'll have like a field officer. Um, so one of our local partners, World Vision is huge, right? World Vision is, does tons of work and they work in all over the world. Um, they might have a field officer in Uganda that is a part of sort of the um, organization or logistics of things, but it's what we're funding is really the, the actual, um, the boots on the ground, the, the people that are doing the drilling and the digging and the working with the community. The biggest thing is often language, right? Like they speak the language of the people that they're serving and um, they can relate in a way that we could never relate. Um, as much as we would love to, it's, it's, it's really about building trust for us. And we want to make sure that in order for a project to be sustainable and for a community to use it, to even use it, they need to trust that um, the people that are implementing it. Yeah. And that puts more into their economy too. By the Yes. yes. The, so this yeah. is a, a really interesting statistic that I, I didn't share, but um, I think it's really wonderful. So we indirectly employ on average every year about 1,100 people through all of the, our local partners. So um, I think that's something to celebrate um, and something to be really excited about is that these are, these are, this is job creation too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you have a fair, fair number of people uh, in that photograph you showed of all the people who were gathered for your annual meeting. There were quite yeah. a few people who, yeah. who actually directly work for Charity Water. Yeah, so we're, we're really sort of unique in that we do everything in-house. So every, like our website, um, we have in-house in -house engineers, we in-house designers, a filmmaker that helps us build content. The team I'm on is about six people. Um, and we work with thousands of donors. Um, there's a whole team just for the spring because it's such a massive um, initiative for us. Um, and of course we do have a water programs team too. They, they go to the field um, often, but not to actually do the work, but it's more of a relationship building with our local partners, getting to know them and getting to know what they need um, so that we can be the best supporter of their work as we can. Um, so there's, we have we're about 80, a staff of about 80, um, and we're all sprinkled all over the country right now, but, um, about half of us are in New York. Paige, can you share kind of the creative ways people can give? I mean, you talked about the spring, which is yeah. a regular like subscription that people are just like, oh, I'm going to give $20 every month. Um, yeah. But there's also just the well or the campaigns that people set up or giving up birthdays or those kind of creative ways that um, Charity Water receives people's giving. 
Sure, sure. Yes, our monthly giving program I talked a lot about. So that's a great way to give. It's the most sustainable and recurring like need for us is um, that sort of longevity um, and repeatability. Um, also, you could sponsor a project for an entire community. Um, sometimes that's a well, sometimes it's a different solution. Um, the cost varies, but usually it's about $10,000 for like the full cost of the project. Um, and we have those all over, all over Africa and Asia. And we do, we, we fund projects like that every six months. So there's always a new batch of projects every six months. And um, you mentioned fundraising. So I think that's a really, really great way to not only um, help support our work, but just sort of spread the word about um, the need and the water crisis as a whole. It's a really great education tool for the people in your networks. Um, we have a platform on our website called My Charity Water, where you can start a fundraising campaign and people will often give up their birthdays or um, their graduation celebration. They'll ask people to give to a project instead of uh, donating money um, or instead of giving them money, they donate money to Charity Water. Um, we have tons of wild and kooky things that people do like people will grow their beard and then if they can raise a thousand dollars they'll shave their beard or people will run marathons for charity water or people will have a lemonade stand for charity water some of those are my favorite things are when kids have these little fundraisers and then send in twelve dollars and 38 cents it is just like uh, put me to bed that is just like the sweetest thing ever and then send in a picture with it so really like anything you can think of, bake sales, whatever, if you can generate money from it, people do it for charity water or do it for charity, which is really, really fun to see those ideas come to life. All of this can be found on our website and um, I can send you links, Amy, if you want and to, to be shared out too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We also put um, a link on, on our page, on the Bethel page and also on the Facebook page the um, link to Scott's video that just mm -hmm. kind of tells the story yeah. of, you know, his background and how he started Charity Water and just, it's very inspiring. And I think that's what hooked me right away when I saw that. And it's inspiring, it's emotional, and it's just a really beautiful story though. And of course, um, that's kind of told it in more detail with the book, yeah. which I still have copies of. They are complimentary. Paige sent me a box of books. And so we have some more if you um, would like a copy. Myrna, I left one in the vestibule for the library, for the um, church library. Um, but let me know. You can um, email me or make a comment, um, add a comment here that you would like a book and I can get you one too. So we have a few copies left. And I just wanted to say that in the chat, I did add some links. So if you tap on that chat um, button at the bottom of your screen, you'll see on the side that there's some links that you can connect with, including the Charity Water story, which is Scott Harrison's story um, that Amy's referring to. There's also the link to the Charity Water website, as well as the link, of course, to our AGF fair, which ends soon. So please participate. Um, I wanted to thank Paige so very much for joining us today. It was absolutely a pleasure to see your presentation, to hear the stories. We are completely inspired. We hope you can come back someday. And I also want to say that um, just personally, um, I'm looking forward to joining the spring. Um, my daughter Tatum literally announced to me last night, mom, I joined the spring. So we watched the video as a family last night and we just talked about how, you know, I just said, you guys are, you know, you could actually start giving, you could do an automatic give every, every month. And she started last night. So, so cool. I think it's pretty cool. I love that system. And um, the one thing I want to segue to Mac on is the fact that, um, this is about relationships, right? I mean, this is so much about trust and building relationships, which of course right now is such a challenge because we don't get to touch each other and hug each other and connect in ways that we're used to. But there are still ways and we are inspired by Charity Water because they are incredibly creative with how they, you know, make this happen. Um, you know, they're persistent and um, they have obvious grit and an incredible network. And um, I, when I was looking just for your bio page, I was scrolling. I'm like, Amy, is she here? I was scrolling down, scrolling. I'm like, how many people work at this place? And I know you just said 80, but it's, 
it's just absolutely completely inspiring. So thank you so much for being with us. Yes, thank you um, for having I, me. And I, I did throw my email in the chat too. If anybody okay. has questions or wants to have another conversation, has more questions that they didn't get that chance to ask, please email me. We can set up a time to chat on the phone too, if you'd prefer. I, I'd love to connect. Well, what you said, Paige, too, as you ended, just like daily generosity, no, you know, no matter where you want to spread that, but, but also like what you said, water changes everything. And when you give to a water project, it's not just bringing clean water and good health. It's, it's ensuring kids and especially girls stay in school and people have jobs and it's a domino effect and it, it changes a lot of lives in many more ways than just health, which of course is a basic need, but it's, um, water is everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I see there are a few people that have asked for copies of books. So Amy, I'm assuming you're going to take note of that. Um, Paige, we'd love it if you just stay with us after this ends just for a couple minutes. And, um, Mac, I'm going to hand this off to the very famous Mac Gimsey, um, our living treasure. We love him and he's going to just, um, wrap us up today. Take it away. And take yourself off mute, Mac, please. Hi, am I on? Oh, You're good. On. Thank you. Well, it, it's really hard to follow any of these acts of you know, Bethel U that uh, Karna and Amy have put together. But I do want to tell you that when you live in a community of saints, uh, we all support each other. And I'm just really pleased to have associations with all of you. And on the screen, I, I see saints. And, and Martin Luther, of course, made it possible for us to be a community of saints. We don't have to be dead for 100 years to be uh, canonized. And, and I'm really grateful for that, that we all are here with a mission. And this mission has just been magnificently presented. Paige, thank you so much for what you've uh, done to help us realize what you are about. It's astounding. And it, it, it pleases me to know that people can have an idea of how to help others. And as they gather together, this becomes a worldwide mission. And in the midst of the COVID uh, crisis, we are um, um, giving birth to a whole new generation of heroes and saints who have come to the aid of people who were uh, destitute and are really making an effort to bring it under control. And so I'm grateful for everything all around. I don't Ooh, I, I really didn't want to say all this, but I have to, and I'm so glad you let me speak. And I, I only have one prayer that I would like to make, and it is on the basis of you know, bearing the burdens of peace and a piece of sculpture that I made uh, at the request of the college to give to two uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureates, David Trimble and John Hume of Northern Ireland, who made Ireland safe for children. And uh, it, it was, uh, I was asked to do this while living in the heart of Jerusalem with St. Olaf's students just off David Street. And we had just been to Bethlehem and spent Christmas Eve up the block at uh, Christmas Lutheran Church. And so I was inspired, but also trembling because I had no idea uh, what direction to go. So I decided to make a holy family in bronze. And here you see the, uh, the mother holding uh, her very pregnant stomach because it, that has to be part of the process. And uh, it, the, the child is born and the father holds the child up to the world. And uh, I've got this uh, idea when my wife Jackie was pregnant and saying, I want this bowling ball out of me. <laughs> and, and it happened and on the very top there is a child, an infant child, who is the product of, of this you know, magnificent union. Each of those uh, people, were they were invited to St. Olaf, and they, they have a, a copy of uh, this uh, personally. And uh, I have no idea what uh, this means to somebody when they have it uh, so that they can actually touch the surfaces of it. 
but that's the idea. I want people to touch this and, and get the sense of what it means to be a holy family because we all are holy. So the, the prayer is called Bearing the Burdens of Peace. If peace is a form of ultimate human understanding, before I pass into the heart of God's surrounding, I want to plunge my head into the seas of language and drink from every tongue only the words of kindness. Then with the taste of love in my mouth, I want to whisper silently on wars of shouting at children of abuse, on races from hatred, between embittered genders, within unrighteous religions, and by angered nations. If peace is kindled in children or progeny, before I garland my soul with bouquets of eternity, I want to spill my seeds into the roots of the mercy tree from which hangs the last unsightly corpse of human harm. And for the yet unborn, I want to feel their blood flowing through my flanks that will soak tomorrow in the deep red ages past all our origins, which makes us one human flesh. If peace is to quell all forms of violence against nature and against us as humans, our pathway to peace can become a reality because we know that flashes of anger can never be retrieved and acts of violence cannot be washed away. So I want to sing out to the whole world the sweet sounds of bearing the burdens of peace using your impressions, not just my own, of how and why we live. Peace be with you. Thank you, Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. Wow. Well, I was going to do a big thank you, but I can hardly speak right now. So. <laughs> thank you so much, Mac, for being with us. And um, you uh, inspire us too, so very much. And we appreciate um, how you bring art and life to the world and, um, and how you present it. It's beautiful. So, um, I thank you all so very much for joining us. Um, you are free to leave. Um, thank you so much again for being with us, especially those of you who have um, stuck with us all four weeks. This has been quite an experiment and super inspiring for Amy and I. It just um, grows our desire to continue to spread the word um, and encourage people to think about how they're giving in uh, unique ways. Uh, that might be able to contribute um, and in real ways to people's lives uh, for many years to come. So we'll continue to do this work in, in creative ways. And um, we hope that you will, in, as uh, Paige said, get involved where your heart feels moved. And, uh, and thanks again for joining us. Well, thank, thank you for presenting. You, yep, thank you. Thank Clark, you, Wallace, Judy, Thank you Paige. Uh, your message. The books will be available tomorrow in the vestibule. I left you a message in the chat. So your name will be on it. So in a box under the table. So thank you so much. Thank you, Paige, for being here and spreading the word of charity water. My pleasure. And the word of generosity. Thank you for having me and thank you all for coming and yes. learning more. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. Barb, if you can keep us on while people are leaving, that'd be awesome. I will do that. Thanks, everybody. All Thank right. you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Paige. Yeah, you're so welcome. Great. Great. Thanks for all your work.
Uh, Those are my parents, Paige. Aww. <laughs> Aww. Can I ask one question real quick, actually? Why Central African Republic? Is there a connection there? Uh, that's kind of the beginning of our story. We formed an organization after our son was killed in the Central African Republic. Oh, wow. He was, he was building a church in uh, Bangui. Wow. So it's kind of it's kind of a long story, but we started an organization in 1995, and uh, we've worked since that time in several countries. But the Central African Republic has always been a focus of our work. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So their organization, Lutheran Partners and Global Ministries, in our um, pamphlet and our booklet and on the shopping list and they um, work kind of all over Central Africa Republic, India, um, Guatemala, Guatemala, right? Wow. And um, it started with educate with um, sponsoring a child for their education um, and then just moved into lots of other, you know, health and wellness and wow. we've seen the importance of, um, of clean water. Uh, all over, uh, so we've been involved in, in that uh, quite a bit, and uh, uh, you're doing great work. I, the organ I was just really good to hear more about uh, the breadth of your organization. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> it's just Carol Cole piping in at the end, and my husband and I volunteered quite often in Haiti, oh, yeah. and Dr. Larry Mellon started a hospital there in the late 50s, and he looked around, and he said, we don't need doctors, we need clean water. Mm -hmm. And his father had been the head of Gulf Oil and Larry was the renegade, but he had contacts and he got the people that could drill from Gulf Oil to come out to the Artibonite Valley of Haiti and drill wells. Mm -hmm. And he said, that is the most important thing was to get clean water. And mm -hmm. one of the years while we were there, people started coming in with waterborne diseases and so they set out to find, and sure enough, it had rained a lot. And people thought, why go to the well? We'll just get this water from the stream running down. Yeah. And they found out, why not? <laughs> you don't get water from a stream, yeah. you go to the well. I think that actually brings up a really good point. And um, I don't think I touched on this, but w with all of the work we do, there's also always an educational component to it. So the, uh, some education around sanitation, hygiene, best practices, behavior change, because people are so used to, well, if the well's here, but a little bit closer is this stream, why would I, why would I go to the well? Why don't I just go to the stream? So there is a lot of um, necessary work that's not just about the actual construction, but the, you know everything else that incorporates using that well and why that is so important over maybe something you know your family has done for hundreds of years you've gone to the river. Um, so um, that's a, that story really resonates. Thank you. That reminds me of when we were in Africa after my brother died, we visited the, the church that had been finished by another architect. And um, I'll never forget when we went, um, mom and dad to the, you know, to where they were doing the community growing, you know, where Manioc is the is the staple food for many populations, and and it's you know if it's not cooked a certain way, it's actually it can kill you. <laughs> it's poisonous, um, and uh, and and they're so used to eating manioc, um, but it doesn't have any nutritional value. And so, yeah. there were you know there were people, you know, kind of coming in to help um, teach agriculture and. And I remember so vividly, they were talking about how uh, the, those who were growing, the natives who were growing this would sell it in the markets, but then go back to eating their manioc. They wouldn't necessarily eat it themselves because those habits and that, those cultural traditions are so strong. Sure. Sure. Those are, that's some of, the, those, some of the biggest barriers, I think, is, is helping people learn you know, how to break through those cultural norms. And yeah. People can be overweight and be malnourished mm -hmm. right well that happens in this country too mm -hmm. <laughs> people eat potato chips <laughs> oh true i do love the potato chips <laughs> <laughs> but manioc is a big staple in haiti also yeah oh. manioc they would you could hear them screaming it on the streets they were selling it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh-huh mm -hmm. 
Well, this has been great. Thank you again, Paige and Mac. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. That was beautiful. And oh, that sculpture is just, I think that, that's my favorite one. That's my favorite.